Okay, so I thought because obviously you're Institute of Genetic Engineering, uh, I thought I'd try and tell you a little bit of how we've used genetics to understand pathogenicity and also tease apart bi uh, the biotechnological versatility uh, of this group of bacteria. So this is what I'll talk to you about today. I'll talk to you about Burkholderia and this one particular group called the Cepatia complex, uh, which is just one group of closely related species of Burkholderia that we identified uh, and began to understand their pathogenicity, first of all, uh, in cystic fibrosis, as Vittorio said, how we actually studied what was happening in cystic fibrosis, which strains were spreading, which strains were uh, uh, virulent. Then we've gone on to do even global tracking of certain strains. And then I thought I'd, I'd finish up to show you that actually um, it's not just Burkholderia that are, are problematic. There's a few more emerging organisms that are coming out, particularly when we use microbiome techniques to study cystic fibrosis infection. Then I'll switch completely to tell you about the beneficial uh, things that we found with Burkholderia. They mediate bioremediation, biological control, and plant growth promotion. Uh, and uh, it's really, can we harness some of these good parameters is some of the questions we want to look at. In particular, we found them a very interesting source of antibiotics. And then I'll pose this question right at the end, you know, can we use them as a sort of novel chassis, a novel platform host for biotechnology? Okay, so what sort of bacteria are they? Well, they're gram-negative bacteria, uh, and they uh, belong to this big group of beta proteobacteria, uh, and they were given their own genus name, Burkholderia, only in, in um, 1992, so quite recent uh, as a group of uh, bacteria. Before then, they were thrown in with Pseudomonas, so we knew them as Pseudomonas. And here's the sort of spectrum of where you'd find them. You find them predominantly in the natural environment where they in interact with a lot of organisms, uh, particularly terrestrial and freshwater marine environments is where you'll find these burkled areas. Um, protecting plants, uh, promoting plant growth, degrading pollutants here. They also can cause disease. Uh, burkled area was originally uh, identified as an onion rotting organism uh, by William Burkholder. And obviously in patients with cystic fibrosis, uh, these individuals have a genetic mutation that means they don't clear their um, lungs appropriately. And those lungs then become an environment where bacteria can actually colonize because of that genetic defect. Uh, and as Vittorio said, most of them get pseudomonas, but about 4 or 5% will actually get Burkholderia, and it chronically infects in those lungs. And I'll tell you a whole bunch of problems associated with that uh, shortly. Okay, so this is how it all sort of started. Um, we started to see lots of clinical issues with Burkholderia. At the time, it was called Pseudomonas cepatia, in fact, because you can see this is 1980, Pseudomonas cepatia in CF. So 1984, started to see just an increased sort of incidence of uh, cepatia uh, in CF. And then these were researchers in, in, in Toronto, in fact, this whole group, Isles and Tablan. Um, they also published then that this infection seemed to cause more disease and more death uh, in these patients. And then a few of these patients actually had what was known as a, a cepatia syndrome. And this is where the, blood go from, um, the bacteria go from the lungs and invade into the blood. And that's pretty rare for cystic fibrosis pathogens. Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas is an invasive organism. If you get a cut with it, it can invade into your bloodstream. But amazingly, CF patients, it never invades from their lung into their bloodstream. Never, never at all Pseudomonas. Burkholderia will do this. Uh, and... Uh, it's, a, it's still the only CF pathogen that actually does that. And so that was a, bi a big problem, this invasive disease. And then by the mid-1990s, we started to see that not only was this p disease killing CF patients, but it could actually spread from one patient to, a, to another and superinfect over other Burkholderia and other organisms. So this issue of transmission uh, really led to the idea that we've got to control infection in CF and stop it spreading. On top of this, then, this group of organisms all being called uh, Pseudomonas cepatia. It turned out that there were multiple species in that group, uh, and a Belgium scientist, Peter Van Dam, was the first person to really start to tease apart what these burkled areas were. And he could see that these isolates that we've been calling burkled area cepatia were lots of genetic species. If you use traditional microbiology and biochemical tests, you couldn't differentiate those species. Um, and so at the time, he called them genomivars, saying they are a distinct species, but we don't have a name for them. And it was only when we found tests that could split them apart that you could name them as individual species. And so this name, the Bicepatia complex, uh, became the name that we called the whole group of species uh, until we've identified them. So that was 1997, if you sort of make a note of, of that date. 
see how we progressed. So one of the first things that we wanted to do very rapidly uh, was we had our microbial technicians identifying these cepaceas. They didn't know what species they were. Uh, and one of the things we thought we could do is, can we get a quick molecular diagnostic to do this with? Uh, and so uh, Peter had published that the 16S gene wasn't very diverse. So that's the gene that we use to identify most bacteria, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. But this sequence isn't variable enough in Burkholderia to, to tell one Burkholderia for another. So I just went to the databases and looked for other genes. And this shows you how old I am, because at that stage, I searched for other genes from Burkholderia. And there were just two sequences for this recombinase A. Uh, Rec A is just a gene for DNA repair in bacteria. All bacteria have it. And there happened to be two, two alternate genes. I, ali I, I aligned those two genes. And I just designed PCR primers to the front of the gene and the rear of the gene. And they turned out to be absolutely specific to the Burkholderia cepacea complex. There was no primer design involved. It was just like 20 bases, 20 bases. That was the level of it. So it shows you that sometimes you can just get it right by luck as opposed to anything else. And so we could amplify these, this gene then from all these different Burkholderia. And that gives you a nice single product. And then initially, because we didn't have a lot of DNA sequencing, we just used restriction enzymes here, um, a restriction digest, to generate a polymorphism. So these patterns now that you see are specific to, this is Burkholderia vetnamensis, this is Burkholderia multivorans, and these are other genome of ours, one and three. So you can see a nice restriction pattern specific for each species. And of course, once we got, we're able to do some sequencing, you can actually sequence the whole rec A gene then and use a phylogenetic tree. And here you can see now this phylogenetic tree, all these isolates have been called cepacea. Uh, but in fact, they all split out into quite different species, Vietnamensis, Santhina, uh, Cenocepatia, Pyrocinia, Stabilis, all very different species, and we could see that from the sequence. And so this rec -A gene became a, a very useful taxonomic tool to help us differentiate these species. So where are we now? So um, this is a review from John LaPuma in 2010. Uh, and at that stage, we had 17 species formally named uh, for everything that we called Cepatia. Uh, and this, year, this last year, we've had an 18th species uh, named as well. Um, and we've now dropped this idea of calling them genome of ours because they're all too many. Uh, we actually try and give them uh, different names. And what I'll tell you about uh, shortly is that the strains we see spreading a lot in cystic fibrosis tend to be this Burkholderia cenocepatia as being the highly transmissible and virulent strain. Um, and then I'll also give you a little story here uh, to do with uh, Burkholderia contaminans and how this comes out from a metagenomic study uh, of the Sargasso Sea. <coughs> so what's in a name? What's the problem with this naming? So basically, it became really clear as we started to look at these Burkholderia bacteria in cystic fibrosis that there were different species causing different outcomes with infection and different domination of infection. So the actual name was really important in the context of, um, of the species. So, one of the other things we wanted to do was understand the spread of these patient, uh, of these isolates uh, occurring in patients. And so whenever we had the patients coming into the clinic, they would give a sputum sample. We would culture the Burkholderia. And then we used this very simple genetic fingerprinting. This is random amplified polymorphic DNA fingerprinting, which is just a very simple PCR. And it just amplifies a genetic fingerprint for your strain of interest. And here you can see a patient. Um, uh, they're coming into clinic from 11 years all the way through to, to 17 years. And every time that patient gives a sample, we culture the bacteria, and it's the same strain. So even though this patient has been given lots of antibiotics, you've never cured the infection. The same strain is always there causing this chronic infection. And at the time, this patient only had that strain. Nobody else in the clinic had the strain. But he started to socialize with lots of social contacts, all teenagers, basically kissing the girls in the clinic. And unfortunately, all of these individuals um, got the, uh, this infection, and they picked up exactly the same strain. But what was worse is these individuals then passed away in the next two to three years. And this individual survived. The index case survived all of that. So you can see how devastating that was. So this gives you an idea, then, of, of what was happening. So here's the number of new cases of Burkholderia. So it's not large numbers. You know, The scale only goes up to 25 individuals. This is the time period, 81 to 85, roughly five-year blocks you see here. Each square box is a, is a patient. If the box is colored, it means that patient strain is shared by another patient. So here in the early 80s, um, 
you know, already evidence that two patients have the same strain. This is BC and Asapatia, sorry, I should say, BC. Yeah. Vancouver, yeah, this is in Vancouver. This is our clinic in Vancouver. Um, multivorans, this is another species you can see here. By 85 to 90, again, more sinus apatia, more evidence that there's you know, shared strains. Multivorans, all of these patients, the box is not colored. It means they have their own unique strain. There's no evidence that anyone else has it. And then this is the real problem. So this is literally when I was postdocing in the center. Within one year, two years, we saw lots of individuals getting exactly the same strain here, this block, this block, and this block. And these turned out to be four very dominant strain types that were spreading from one patient to another. These were very socially active patients. They saw themselves in hospitals, and they met outside of hospital and interacted a lot. And this is probably the reason we saw these organisms spread. We also saw that here, this patient, 32, had multivorans initially, but they acquired cyanocepatia, and that became the dominant infection. And again, this, this patient also had multivorans, got cyanocepatia, same here. So we saw this strain replacement, and it was always in one direction, never the other way. And so we were able to see that this was caused a lot because we put patients together who had cepatia. We knew cepatia could spread from one patient to another, but at the time, we didn't know that there were different species in that group of isolates. Uh, and so that may have caused the problem in hospital. But afterwards, when we understood this, uh, and this has now happened all over the world, all CF patients now are very individually sort of segregated and separated from all other CF patients to stop the spread of infections. You also educate them that there is a, they're carrying a transmissible organism, and you educate the caregivers, so the, the physicians, the nurses. They also need to know that you've got a patient who could spread an infection and you carry out good infection control. And post-1995, we were able to do this in Vancouver. And immediately, you can see this spike has gone. And now we're down to a much lower rate. Most of these individuals, the, the box is uncolored, which means they all have their unique strain. So that means they're probably picking up this unique strain from the natural environment or somewhere like that. They're not at least picking it up from a, another, another patient. So this has definitely worked. And I'll show you at the end, even in a big center in Manchester, uh, it's also worked to cut down spread, and this kind of thing is used all over the world. So that immediately shows you the, the, the sort of problem. And, and here's the sort of problem spelled out in terms of the two uh, different species. So these are sort of clinical outcome parameters you would see with cyanocepatia versus multivorans. So we did have more patients with cyanocepatia, 40 versus 19 uh, patients. They're, they're picking it up roughly at the same age, um, sort of teenage years. Nearly all of them had pseudomonas, but these guys had more pseudomonas than, than these. These are slightly younger, so maybe this is the reason. Here's one of the big things you see, that cyanocepatia, when it comes in, it tends to cause a chronic infection. So in, in the group that we studied, it was 2.3 years was the average, but actually these are often you know, four, five, six years. It's just that this is the average. Whereas many of these Burkholderia multivorans, they were transient infections. 50% of them came, and they'd go within three months. Uh, so there's, you know, there was some response to therapy, or they just disappeared. The ability to replace infection, we always saw this, that cyanocepatia would replace multivorans. We never saw the reverse. Multivorans was never capable of replacing cyanocepatia. So there's this capability uh, for superinfection. And then very, very sadly, this is the sad statistic. Just in the study time that we followed in about eight years, we had 43% mortality. And actually, this has gone right up to 70 80% now. Most of these individuals with cyanocepatia have actually passed away. Uh, so it's a, it's a really, really problematic, very, very nasty infection. And so you can imagine CF individuals and their families uh, caused a, a really big worry at the time. So to show you where we've gone since then is we've actually developed tools that can allow us to track these strains globally and look at global epidemiology. Uh, and this comes about because we've got whole genome sequences. And what we were able to develop was a multi-locus sequence typing tool. And basically, with multi-locus sequence typing, you, you sequence genes from all over your genome. And from the DNA sequence, you can then find polymorphisms, such as this T going to an A. And that will define you an allele for a, for a particular gene and a strain you know, for a particular isolate. And so we chose these genes here. Seven happens to be kind of the magic number. We were able to get six on the first chromosome. And you can see they're spread out, so you try and choose them to be spread out. These are all genes that all Burkholderia have. 
And you can see RACA is one of them, which is good, because we already knew that worked very, very well. And we managed to get one gene that was on the second chromosome. But the second chromosome here, or Replicon, is, is much more variable than the first. So it's quite difficult to know whether in all our Burkle area that's there. So you sequence those genes. And at the, at the time, we were doing this by PCR. You PCR up each gene, and then you sequence it. So it's, it's a little bit more work. Nowadays, we just sequence the whole genome, and you pull out the, the genes of interest to do this multi-locus sequence typing. But the nice thing is you can store all this data in public databases. And then it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can sequence your isolate. You can compare against the database, just like GenBank. And you can see then whether any strain matches your particular allele. So this is where this Sargasso C story starts. Um, I, I went to a conference in Cancun, uh, the, um, uh, what was it, uh, ISMI conference in Cancun. And Craig Venter was there talking about the Sargasso C metagenomic data set. I don't know if you know who Craig Venter is, but he's the guy behind the human genome sequence. Very controversial, but actually without him, he, we wouldn't have got the human genome sequence. So when he finished sequencing the human genome, he had lots of DNA sequences in these various facilities that he had. And he thought, well, let's actually get into some interesting science as well on top of the human genome. And let's sequence some microbial habitats and find out what organisms are there by metagenomics. Take the total DNA from your environment, sequence it all, and then from the DNA sequence, you say there was a Burkholderia there or there was a Pseudomonas there. You don't have to culture anything. So he took his yacht, this is his yacht, that 80 million pound yacht, took it to the Sargasso Sea. He put, took some water from the surface sea water. He filtered out the microorganisms, and then he extracted total DNA from those microorganisms, gave them to the sequencers, and put together genomes or bits of genomes, so metagenomic data sets. And I remember he was talking, he said, oh, we got a Burkholderia. And I'm thinking, well, Burkholderia, seawater? We've never seen it in seawater ever. But anyway, I got straight back home, and I downloaded this Burkled area from the uh, database SAR1. I took down the seven genes, and we actually constructed a multi-locus sequence type of just number 102. And there it sat in our database. And then we started to screen other isolates from all over the world. And this Czech cystic fibrosis strain, uh, sorry, this sequence is just a DNA sequence. We don't have any isolate to go with this. It just came out of the seawater. It's raw DNA. There's nothing cultured. But in our lab, we had this strain sent to us by, by Pavel Drinek in the Czech Republic. It matched this at all loci, so it was absolutely identical, so it's a clone of that. Then we started to look at some um, um, Spanish sheep with, with infections, mastitis infections. That was absolutely identical again, all cultivable. There'd been an outbreak in the States where nasal spray had got contaminated with Burkholderia. So Burkholderia is very good at contaminating industrial processes. And this nasal spray had been contaminated and then inhaled, and these poor people had got infections due to Burkholderia. They were identical. Lots more CF isolates from all over the world, including here in Italy. And also in Brazil, unfortunately, they'd had a, an outbreak of um, infection in renal dialysis. So patients who have kidney problems need lots of dialysis. And the water lines in this machine had become contaminated with Burkholderia. And that strain that was causing the renal dialysis infections was also a clone. Absolutely identical to this. Um, and so we actually ended up calling that, a few years later, that strain, we ended up calling it Burkholderia contaminans. It turned out to be a new species. And that's because we think it's very good at contamination here. And we think the reason it was in the Sargasso Sea data set was not because it was in the Sargasso Sea, but because it contaminated the water lines in Craig Venter's boat. Uh, and if you look at the actual evidence of the metagenome, there's almost no polymorphisms in this Burkholderia sequence which you see in normally in, in, in environmental sequence data sets. So that suggests that he sequenced the pure clone, almost the pure plug of bugs that got into his uh, machine. But um, we published that a few years back, and uh, it's a nice little study. OK, so again, from John LePuma's review, basically we've been able to do a lot with cystic fibrosis infection in terms of uh, stop Burkholderia being such a problem. Um, and what we've done is really been able to drive down, here's the number of patients infected in the US, the proportion of Burkholderia patients. And this is Cenus apatia. And you can see the epidemic and virulence of Cenus apatia have really dropped a lot. So that's great. Um, our research has been very effective. Uh, but it also means we, we don't have any funding anymore because it's not such a big problem. But on the back of that, multivorans seems to be going up a little bit. And so now you can see multivorans. It's 37% of all Burkholderia infections here. Cenus patients dropping away. 
And the US also has a big problem with gladioli, 15%. Uh, so <coughs> that's quite interesting. Um, uh, and gladioli is not part of this cepacia complex. It's a separate burkled area. And in fact, more known for its plant associations and plant virulence uh, than it is as a human infection. So the good news is we've really got rid of the problem in cystic fibrosis. So I'd like to then just tell you a little bit here before we finish with CF about the interactions with other cystic fibrosis microorganisms. And so this idea of polymicrobial infections, microbial diversity, a lot of researchers are starting to look at this. When you culture something basically like sputum, if you culture it, you'll see lots of different microorganisms growing. Uh, here you see this real mess. And obviously what sputum microbiology tries to do is we try and culture a pure pathogen out of this and then we try and identify it, and the physicians treat that. And so with, with cystic fibrosis, you've got Pseudomonas, Burkholderia, Staphylococcus. These are the real pathogens that are treated in cystic fibrosis, okay? Uh, and a few more, mycobacteria, fungi, some, some other pathogens. But obviously, we, we all know that within this mixture, there's a lot of organisms that we can't either grow in the lab, or you need to use very selective media, or in fact, anaerobic conditions, uh, to grow them out. And so there's a lot of microbial diversity work now showing that actually there are hundreds of organisms growing in this sputum, and a large majority of them are, are complete anaerobes. So Prevotella here is a, an obligate anaerobe. It, it, sputum is a very thick mixture, and basically oxygen is completely depleted uh, within it, even though it's right there in the lung. It, there's anaerobic, so Prevotella is a strict anaerobe. And this other group, Streptococcus milleri, they're facultative anaerobes, more associated with the oral cavity, but clearly they're growing in the lung as well. So we're starting to, 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 to want to understand a lot more about this. So we wanted to get a handle on this and, and do a bit of analysis. And so we, we, we didn't have a lot of sequencing available. And so again, I looked towards very simple PCRs. And this is a particular PCR called the ribosomal intergenic spacer analysis. Uh, and what this does is most bacterial systematics, we use this gene here, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And so this is the gene you can draw the tree of life from and look at bacterial diversity. And it's right next to the 23S and the 5S in this operon. But there's a space here, and this space gets transcribed. Uh, and you can design a primer from the end of the 16S gene uh, and the other end of the 23S gene. And all bacteria will have those sequences. And you can just amplify up the space. So if it's from a Burkle area, Burkle area has to be complicated. It doesn't have just a single space size. It has three different space sizes, 670, 815, and 880 bases. But if you did this same PCR off Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas is much simpler to understand, you just get a single intergenic spacer for all of the different uh, ribosomal RNA loci. So you always see a band of 753 bases. And so now when you take this PCR and you perform it on a mixed sample of DNA, so where you might have scraped bacteria or taken bacteria out of sputum, what it should generate is a diversity profile. So you might have a lot of Burkholderia giving you 800 base pair fragments here, and maybe just a little bit of Pseudomonas giving you a 753 base pair fragment here. And so this profile is a very simple idea of how many organisms you have there, and also which is dominant and which is very sort of not very dominant in your mixture. So it's a very simple profiling thing. And we thought this might be a good PCR to now look on a whole clinical scale. So that's exactly what we did uh, with the Manchester CF clinic. So here we've got 93 adult CF patients, so about a third of the clinic. And they gave 200 sputums, and that's what you see here. And actually, this sputum DNA had been uh, uh, extracted as part of routine viral diagnosis. So many CF patients get tested for influenza, rhinovirus infections. And to do this, virology has been using DNA for diagnostics for years. It's only bacteri bacteriologists that bother to grow anything anymore. And I think this shows how ancient we are in many practices. Really, we should be going straight to, to DNA to identify things. So we used this DNA extracted for viral analysis, and we were able to get nice bacterial profiles from it. And in this mixture here, you can see this is a clustering of all these profiles. But all this group here that separates at the top, when you look at what's common in this group, they nearly all have culture positive for Pseudomonas. Okay, over 60, 70% culture positive for Pseudomonas. A lot of these individuals, you can see the Pseudomonas amplicon here. That's right there at 750. But for some of them, you see actually they have very little Pseudomonas amplicon, but a lot more of something else. This band is, in fact, more around where you'd see 
the streptococci running. So you could see that almost immediately. But then what's this group of patients down here that seem to have a very different diversity, and their diversity seems to be dominated, again, with just one or two things. When, when you look at that particular group there, they tend to be the ones who either have Burkholderia, Acromobacter, Stenotrophomonas, or again, other Burkholderia. And so this, this profiling method separates them out very, very quickly. And you can see, again, when Acromobacter gets in, it, it, everything else disappears. It's just Acromobacter pretty much by itself. And when you do deep sequencing, this is the actual gold standard, when you do deep sequencing, it backs up that this is dominated. Burkholderia looks like it's a lot of things, but this is because Burkholderia has those different sized intergenic spaces. So you actually see one at 670, one at 880, one at 850. You see a mixture you know, of, of things. But it's a very simple profiling method. And uh, what we could see is that these guys uh, uh, are coming up a lot. They're dominating patients. Uh, and unfortunately, the clinical lab miss many of these gram-negative bacteria. They're quite good at finding Burkholderia because they know what a problem Burkholderia is. But many of these get missed completely by culture, or they're put down as gram-negative question mark, and they're never identified. But what you can see is that's the only infection there. Pseudomonas might be 1% of this mixture, but really we should be treating the acromobacter infection, not the pseudomonas infection. And so this is something cystic fibrosis really has to start to address in terms of proper directed therapy towards the dominant pathogens in these patients. So to summarize then, hopefully with Burkholderia, what you've seen is they're very problematic um, infections. They, they, they spread. Uh, they're very antimicrobial resistance. Cenocepatia was one of the most virulent and transmissible, but they'll all, they'll all transmit. Multivorans seems to be emerging now uh, uh, as a dominant species, but most of these isolates are, are unique to individual patients. We don't have any multivorans outbreaks going on. And you do need molecular testing to identify them. Um, and this sort of microbiome analysis is now starting to tell us that it's actually quite an interesting picture to look at what other organisms are there. And here's the data from the Manchester Clinic um, where we, we did that sputum analysis, just to give you an idea of what's happening there with Burkholderia. Um, so over the 23 years, they've seen 460 adult CF patients. A lot of them have pseudomonas, over 80%. Uh, 93 had um, Burkholderia. The total deaths they've seen in those 23 years is 173. Only 31% has been caused by patients who have pseudomonas. But look at this figure here. 67% has been caused by uh, patient, uh, those few patients who had Burkholderia. So it still is the hardest thing to treat and deal with in cystic fibrosis. It really is uh, a major problem. OK, so let's move away from the nasty stuff now and look at some bacterial beneficial traits and now try and leave you with a different flavor that actually, in infection, these are problematic organisms, but in nature, they don't tend to do this, I think, generally. So we'd like to go on to this antibiotic discovery. So basically, um, you can see that Burkholderia, here's a Burkholderia, and this is a Basidiomycete fungus that grows in woodland. And you can see these Burkholderia, they, they secrete things that are very antifungal, and many different antifungal compounds uh, have been characterized over the years. Um, and this ability to sort of inhibit fungi is um, really um, useful in the fact that when you look at crops that do very well, often you'll find Burkholderia at the roots. And this is work from uh, Jennifer Park in Oregon, where they coat these pea seeds with Burkholderia ambifaria, in fact, here. And you can see these peas have done really, really well when they've been planted in, in, in um, fungal-infected soils. And these are peas that have been treated with a chemical fungicide here, uh, and again, they don't look as healthy. They've survived the fungal attack, but they're not as healthy. So you can see that this actually promotes plant growth and protects them uh, from pathogenic fungi. But we wanted to ask the question, what about their antibacterial activity? If they're secreting lots of fungals, antifungals, surely some of these, A, might be antibacterial, or could they be killing lots of other bacteria? So we screened a small collection, part of my collection, about 268. Uh, we found just a small number that were antigram negative, about a quarter that were antigram positive, and over 30% um, that were antifungal. So, you know, antifungal ability is really an intrinsic ability of Burkholderia. But when you start to look at this spectrum of antibacterial activity, it's really quite exciting. You could see here's Ambifaria inhibiting another Burkholderia multivoran. So this is producing 
something that's killing the, the, one of these other Burkholderias that's dominant in cystic fibrosis. Here's an Amvifaria inhibiting Acinetobacter baumannii. So Acinetobacter is a really problematic intensive care unit pathogen uh, that's causing a lot of surgical wounds, and it's very antibiotic resistant. Uh, and you can see this Burkholderia kills it. This is Pseudomonas fluorescens in the middle here. And Pseudomonas fluorescens makes mupiricin. This is a clinically used antibiotic to eradicate methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. But you can see this MRSA I've put on top here. That's completely methicillin-resistant. But here we have a Burkholderia that's still active on that mupiricin-resistant MRSA. So we've got an interesting compound there uh, that we'd like to look at. Now, at this point, I ran into problems because I'm not a chemist. So the next step is to find out chemically what some of these metabolites are that are being secreted. I'm a, I'm a geneticist, uh, so I decided to take a genetic approach. So what are some of these novel antibiotics being produced by Ambifaria? So we were very lucky in that this AMMD um, organism, we had a whole genome for it that had been sequenced uh, already. Uh, and uh, we like to use transposons the same as Hitendra. They're good, good versatile tools. So we used a simple transposon mutagenesis screen to introduce transposons and then screen mutants and look to see when this antibiotic zone of clearing here was being switched off. And here you can see a mutant with no antibiotic production. And so then we can sequence the genes that flank that mutation and say, what's the gene that's been switched off? And here you can see we lost um, activity against Burkholderia multivorans. You can have some mutants that are less active against Staphylococcus aureus and then some mutants that are less active against fungi, such as candida. Um, interesting, some, some mutants that seem to produce a little bit more. So these, these mutations turned out to be in all sorts of genes, in particular quorum sensing. So um, this was interesting to know that many of these antimicrobial metabolites are being uh, under the control of quorum sensing. But it really wasn't until we hit this polyketide biosynthesis island here, are a number of genes with mutations in that gave us a clue as to what type of antibiotic that was being produced. And basically, it's a polyketide. So um, streptomycin, uh, uh, erythromycin, tetracycline, all these antibiotics we use clinically. Um, nearly 90% of all the clinical antibiotics we use are, are polyketides. And most of them are made by the gram-positive streptomyces. Those are our major antibiotic producers. Very few are made by gram-negatives, as far as we're aware yet. Uh, but here, you've got a Burkholderia. Uh, producing uh, these polyketides. And at that point, I did need to speak to a chemist uh, to get an idea of what was going on. And I spoke to this person here, Greg Chalice. Um, Greg's a, a natural product chemist at the University of Warwick. And basically, I sent him the DNA sequence. Uh, but biochemists are so good, they can look at the DNA sequence. And they can look at the proteins being encoded and see that this protein has an acyl transferase domain. It has a ketosynthase domain. It has a dehydra dehydratase domain. And from that alone, the domain structure, they can infer what polyketide it could make. And so I sent him the sequence. And two or three weeks later, um, basically, he, he, he came up with what, what this was doing. He also told me that this is a really unusual um, type of cluster. Because here, these genes have the acyl transferase group um, within it. So this is what's known as cis. Uh, AT polyketide synthases. And normally that phylogenetic group just occurs by itself. But Burkholderia decided to stick in a trans AT1 on the very end, a completely different phylogenetic group of, uh, of polyketide synthase, hybridized onto a cluster that should be that. And you could see the whole structure here being made. Um, and eventually he came up with that this should be the actual structure of what was being produced. And we were able to then, well, he was able to then do the actual chemistry uh, and figure out the structure and show that, indeed, it was this n uh, that was the antibiotic being produced by this AMMD. n had been found in the 1980s, but we, never, we didn't know the pathway. And actually, we can engineer the whole pathway now. And also, we didn't know it had activity on multivorans or acinetobacter. Uh, it's also a really interesting elongation factor inhibitor, which is a class of protein synthesis that we haven't targeted yet. So it's worth potentially looking at this uh, molecule further. So we've started to look now much more at these Burkholderias. And here are more Burkholderias. Um, we've taken an extract uh, from our medium and then run it out in a thin layer chromatography plate. And this is all the different compounds fluorescing under UV light. And so you can see this secondary metabolite mixture spotted here has lots of different compounds that separate on our thin layer chromatography. 
And then what we can do is overlay that plate with a, with a biological test organism to see which one of these compounds has a biological activity. Here against the yeast uh, candida. Here's MMD. You can see NSLOX in here has, has activity against candida. So do these quinolones. These are the signaling quinolones. They, they're quite antimicrobial, in fact. There's some unknown things here that we don't have a clue. And this is pyrrole nitrine up here, together with plasticizer. Be really careful when you do these experiments. Make sure you do it all in glassware, because plas the plasticizers used is, are really quite antimicrobial. And so we found that out when we did the actual mass spec and things that there was plasticizer. But some of these burkled areas are producing very interesting things here that, that don't migrate, and a bunch of unknowns that we don't know about, so we really want to figure them out. Uh, and when you do these with pathogens, you can see here, uh, here's methicillin-resistant um, uh, staphylococci. You see anisloxins active on it. We have this compound here, compound G, which is also active. Um, those that are active against multidrug resistant yeast, uh, vancomycin-resistant enterococci, um, your E. coli's, or here, Acinetobacter baumannii, uh, that you have these you know, different activities. So we'd like, like to screen and find out more of these different, what more of these different uh, compounds are. When you also look at where these are encoded on the chromosome, we can actually see that most of these are actually encoded here on this chromosome 3, or the third chromosome, or replicon, uh, because Burkle Dairy has this unusual bacterial genome uh, of multiple uh, replicons. So from, from, from looking at that um, analysis and actually seeing the production of some of these interesting metabolites, we then wanted to just look at the, the overall genomes to say what's the capacity of Burkle area genomes to, to encode secondary metabolism. And there's this very nice uh, web-based tool called AntiSmash here, uh, published by Blin et al. And so we put into that uh, uh, some different uh, genomes. Uh, we put in 32 Streptomyces genomes, 21 Burkle area, and 17 Pseudomonas. So your Streptomyces are your gold standard here. These are what most of our clinically derived antibiotics come from. They devote, on average, 14% of their genome to a pathway that encodes a secondary metabolite, an antibiotic of some sort. But Burkle Dairy, you can see there's a huge variance, but actually, on average, 10% of their genome is devoted to secondary metabolism, and that's nearly double that you would find in most um, Pseudomonas. And not only do they devote a lot of their genome to metabolism, also they have many of these very large 70 to 100 kilobase modular clusters, these polyketide type clusters, and nod uh, modular non-ribosomal peptide synthases that also make these antibiotics. Okay, so what, what I want to sort of finish up with then is to say, well, we now know that these Burkle dairy are producing lots of really interesting metabolites, um, lots of interesting antagonistic molecules. On top of this, we know they can break down pollutants. So a few years back, we looked at this Burkle dairy vietnamensis and its ability to degrade phenol here. And we found this entire pathway, this TOM pathway, that breaks phenol down uh, into acetyl-CoA that can just be metabolized. <clears throat> and again, you can see this bioremediation pathway to degrade phenol is essentially modular. You can take this whole cluster, move it. It's, it's carried on a plasmid. Uh, and you can move it and make a strain degrade phenol. And Burkle Dare is very good at doing that. So you've got a modular cluster here that you could move around just to degrade phenol. So hopefully what I've shown you is these Burkle Dare produce lots of interesting uh, antibiotics. We've got this isoenesloxin, uh, and so we're trying to work that up as an interesting antimicrobial. We've got a couple of other interesting candidates. Um, that compound G is a, is a macrolide uh, that we're trying to characterize. And then genome mining here can really facilitate discovery um, in, in the sense it can identify certainly antimicrobial uh, uh, biosynthesis pathways very quickly, and then you can actually go and look for what the actual antimicrobials and the structure might be. So hopefully we'll be able to look more at this engineering, and from that genetic engineering we might be able to develop actual biotechnological strains that have been deleted in their virulence factors uh, but still have all the versatile functions that are there uh, and important for uh, uh, biotechnological functions in nature. But obviously, that's a long-term goal. Whether we'll get there uh, is another matter. But there's a lot of plant beneficial and bioremediation functions that these organisms uh, definitely work, have and are worth tapping. Okay. And so then there's lots of people to collaborate, different people in the lab. Othman Boescher did lots of the antifungal work um, and helped us with that. Uh, Li Jiang Song and Greg Chellis are the chemists in Warwick who have helped. Uh, 
And then Julian Parker at the Sanger Center has helped us get a genome sequence from these antibiotic producers. In terms of the CF work, that's work with Will Flight and Andrew Jones at the Manchester Adult uh, CF Clinic uh, that we're starting to tease apart that uh, polymicrobial uh, work. And lots of different funding agencies um, that are funding all the different projects. And in particular now, we've got a nice grant from the Biotechnology Biology Research Council to fund antibiotic discovery uh, in, these, in these vertical dairy. And I'll finish there. Okay, thank you. Thank you.